Spotify people, and if you're watching live, checking us out on YouTube, or listening on your favorite podcast provider, you are most definitely my people. Welcome to another episode of Botch Bots and Share Shots. I'm your host, a chef by trade and a mark by choice. I am the Will Gray, and joining me tonight is a guy been known for tearing up death matches for as long as death matches have been a thing, it feels like. He is the mental messiah in St. Lane. Lane, thanks for coming on. Chat about some bread and some brother. How are you? Good, man. How are you? Excellent. Um, I'm excited about this conversation. Um, I've been, I've been curious about this side of the wrestling world for a while. So I'm, I'm super curious about it. So I always start my interviews though, kind of the same way. Uh, how did you get into wrestling initially? Um, when you decided, okay, I want to be a pro wrestler. Like what was that process like for you? Um, actually it was, um, I was working at a, silence my phone. I don't want to be interrupted. Um, I was working at a video store. I just got out of the service and I was in college and working at a video store in Alabama. And this local wrestler came in and, uh, he asked if we put up a flyer in our window, me, my manager and I, and another guy in there, we were huge wrestling fans. We were like, hell yeah, man, put it up there. And we were start uh, came up a conversation with him, you know, about, we we're out wanting to be wrestlers and stuff, and, uh, and we struck a deal up with him, and um, he basically got free movie rentals for the rest of his life. But uh, <laughs> but uh, he, um, yeah, we, we went went to uh, started training in Athens, Alabama, for, for a promoter named Alvin Wallace. He used to be a NWA affiliate uh, a longer time ago up there, uh, but of course he stopped paying. He stopped keeping up with the dues, I guess when. The NWA flopped over in the 90s when WCW became, well, became WCW and whatnot. Yeah, he's that old kind of old, old, that old of a promoter. He's he's no longer with us now, though. But uh, I, I got my start through his promotion. I was trained by some local wrestlers. One of them was uh, Charlie Swinger. Um, he was he was the guy who 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 actually put up the um, flyers and stuff. He uh, he trained us. And he had a couple of other guys with him who were, uh, who, who were, who were a little, who were not as, who were n new to the business, but you know, they worked with us too. And, uh, and, and 2002 is when I made my debut and I wasn't, and I wasn't doing my, any, uh, a hardcore or anything of like that. I was just doing, you know, the stuff you saw on, on the television and stuff. Even though I knew of ECW, I watched CCW, and I knew of the Japanese death matches and stuff. I loved what Cactus did. I thought that stuff was, was, was awesome, but I knew that's And I, I kind of mentioned those things, you know, I was like, yeah, does anybody do hardcore stuff or whatever? You know, like, no, we don't do that around here. You know, that's only for, unless it's real important, which I understand perfectly fine. But, you know, um, yeah, he. Uh, I just I went out, made my debut as a uh, traditional professional wrestler, and uh, did that for a couple of years. So when you broke into the business in the early two thousands, you're looking at a lot of like TNAs. Your your late the, the very end of the WCW run, WWE. Um, what wrestling were you exposed to growing up before you broke into the business? Well. Um, uh, I was first. I was exposed to WWF, believe it or not. Even though I lived in the South, uh, I, I first saw Hulk Hogan. You know, that was the guy who who really caught my eye. And then, you know, and, and then from there, you know, my mom married, remarried my step to my stepdad. He was a wrestling fan, a smart wrestling fan too. But I, before I even knew it was smart, he was smart. But I didn't know he he kept me in the. He tried to smarten me up, but I was like, no, it's real, Dad. <laughs> but anywho, he introduced, he's like, oh, well, Hulk, he said, that's the like Hulk Hogan, yeah, whatever. He said, you need to watch some of this. And he introduced me to the NWA, you know, you know, D and Ric Flair, Dusty Rose, the Road Warriors, the Four Horsemen, you know, them guys, you know, the AWA, the Freebirds, the Von Erichs. I mean, I I grew up with all that stuff. I, and you know, and I, I now know, learn about a little bit about Japan through the magazines, you know, because that's why I'd see like Bruiser Brody and Abdul the Butcher being all bloody and stuff. And you know, they have those tapes for sale in the magazines called Mad Maniacs and Maniacs of the Ring and all that stuff, you know. And that stuff intrigued me. And they, 
you know, and I just, I grew up watching it all pretty much. I mean, there was a little time there where I took a break, I guess, right around my teenage years. I went and pursued her. I went and played football, baseball, basketball, did all that stuff. But then I came back around to it. And, and then ECW came around and then, you know, that was, that was, that shit was bonkers. And, and I didn't really get exposed very much to independent wrestling until I started in the independent wrestling business because other than that, that's the only wrestling I knew. I didn't know about, you know, all the CZWs and, and, and stuff like that. I kind of learned that right when I was just getting my training and right around that time, you know? So and I was like, wow, there's more. And they're like, we're like, yes. You know, I was like, oh, this is cool. You know? So yeah. As a wrestling fan, it seems wild when people are talk about, they watch wrestling and then what do you watch? And it's WWE. And then I try to explain to them the vast world that is indie wrestling. And uh, I liken it a lot. And we'll, we'll get to this part of the conversation, like IWTV or something like that. I'm like, it's Netflix for wrestling. Like, do you feel like watching a death match today? Do you feel like watching good Southern wrestling today? Do you want to watch tag team specialists? And that's what I like about something like that is you see it in the American independent scene a lot is just the sheer amount of wrestling you get to see like all the different types now and it seems like you can kind of pick and choose whatever you want to watch but specifically when you started training and you broke into the business how did you go about becoming a hardcore specialist i mean you've worked with some we'll, we'll start the conversation with uh iwa deep south in the early 2000s these guys have a notorious history for some of the uh the more hardcore kind of things what was it like when you started breaking into that scene for the first time Actually, it was it, it was it was it was actually pretty cool. It started off kind of crazy because the very first the show they tried to do that King of the Death match before it was called Carnage Cup got shut down, and you know, and I've I've told the story a hundred times. You know, he he was hiding in the bushes, paying people off as much as he could because people were wanting their money back and stuff, and he wanted to, you know, and people he had booked a whole lot of people on that show, so you know that that was a bad start. But then you know he was like, well, almost I'm gonna run it again. Well. I actually ran a promotion, helped run a promotion with my uh, brother-in-law called Full Thrall Wrestling, and um, I, and we had a building that he could use, and we kind of talked, sweet talked to the lady. She was a sweet lady, and we said, "Oh, well, we promise we'll clean up and all this stuff." <laughs> and and she's like, "Okay, guys." She's just so, I don't know. <laughs> We're like, "Trust us, just 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 let's do it." So. She allowed us to do it, and she let us, she she let uh, she ran it two more times there. But she said, "No, y'all got to do it outside now." But but you know, uh, Kevin got to run Carnage Cup, and it was cool for a while because at first Mike Burns was booking; he was the booker at the time, and so so he so he was kind of so if Kevin had some kind of crazy hair brain idea he wanted to do, which weren't that extreme then. They've kind of evolved over the years. But <laughs> I don't know up or down depending on your taste, but uh, you know, anywho, you know, he at least when if he had some kind of idea that someone might go like, no, Kevin, which I said a lot to him, no, Kevin, uh, Burns would say no, Kevin. So they met, so there was more quality shows. It was better ran, and it had better people in there. Well, as soon as Mike Burns left, you know, Kevin was, was put to his own devices and. The, the matches, the people, the quality just kind of started going down. Yeah, he'll bring some decent people in there, for, in there, but but he'll bring some shit bags in there, or, or guys who are just shouldn't be doing that, those kind of things, and the matches or the stipulations he puts them in, and that's the you know, and that's my my you know my experience with it. And that's why I kind of just kind of left it alone after that. So in. In a hardcore style match, when you're building it up and you're getting ready to go into your story, um, in a traditional wrestling match, guys will say they call it in the ring. Do you feel in a deathmatch setting you're calling it more in the ring, or do you guys plan your spots a little bit more? I don't want to expose it too much, but just curious about the the, the planning process when you're building a, a story in a deathmatch. Um, how does that process start for you guys? Um, honestly, man, I'm, and this is the truth, uh, I've a lot of my matches, the best ones, man. I'll, I'll go over in three or five, three to five minutes is my match is, is what we'll go over. I'll sit there and do a lot elaborations like a lot of people do. We'll just sit there and kind of rub out, kind of do a rub out beginning, 
Uh, use uh, you, uh, if we know what we're going to be using in the match and uh, kind of put in uh, elaborate, we're going to uh, you know give these spots for what we're going to do for that, and then call a finish. And then and then I, and I've always been a walk a walker talker guy or a walk and talk guy or whatever. You, whatever you want to call it. So I've always liked to do it anyway, because I can't remember a whole lot to begin with. So it, it, that, that works out better for me. <laughs> um, when you're, you mentioned it before with some of your promoters you worked with, they said that some of this more hardcore stuff was more of a blow off moment when you build up to it. Um, when you're building your stories and you have the opportunity to, uh, I look at it when I think about hardcore wrestling, it's like when you're painting a palette, and it's like you have an opportunity to do whatever you want. You can use whatever colors you want in this painting. You know what I mean? And that's the way I kind of look at, you know, hardcore deathmatch wrestling is uh, their ability to do anything that they can. I don't want anything that you guys are comfortable doing for this show. Um, when you're when you're doing this, has there been a moment in your career yet where you were like, oh, shit, I can't believe I just pulled that off. Like, have you had one of those? Oh, shit moments. Um, yeah, actually I have, I've had, I've had a couple recently actually, because just because for the, uh, I don't know, I, I just didn't, didn't think I could do it for one reason or another. And it, it turned out like, it just turns out better. I guess I just want, what I'm trying to say is it, it turned out way better than, than, than I could have imagined, you know? So I've had a couple of them. I had one, I've had one recently, Tournament of Death. The uh, Shark Tooth uh, Home Run Derby. I mean, bad a match I had with Brad Cash, man. We got to do the uh, exploding barbed wire bat in there, in there, which is something I've always wanted to do, you know. And it was so cool, and and so we, we did some really cool gnarly stuff. So and I, and afterwards, you know, I just kind of remember driving home, even though I was beat up and not feeling too good because because I, I came down with a flu. Uh, I was like. I, I was like, man, he was like, man, I can't believe we pulled that off, man. That was crazy. It was barely, you know, barely imagine, you know. So yeah, I've had, yeah, I've, I've had some of those moments. Um, looking through your career a little bit, you've had a, a chance to work also with IWA Mid South. Um, Ian Rotten has a uh, both a notorious and infamous career inside of professional wrestling. Um, yes. What was your time like with IWA Mid South? Um. For, you know what? For the most part, it it was good because you know, for the uh, simple fact, I got to meet some of the most amazing people in the whole wide world, and that's no lie, man. Because I mean, I, I I've met fans, I've met colleagues who are like who wrestlers, announcers, managers, referees, people who held that helped at the ring, concession stand people. You know, I mean, just. You know, I, I got to meet a, 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 a great cutaway of people in America, you know, over the years and stuff. And it's it, it's for, and so I'm thankful for the for IWA Mid-South for giving me that opportunity. Now, and, and Ian, for the most part, I mean, he paid me. He never gave me a hit you next time, kid. But, you know, he did pay me. I can't bitch about that because there are people that didn't get paid. But yeah, did he fuck people over? Absolutely, he did. And 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 it's 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 sad because uh, I, you know, I had a long I had a long relationship with with uh, a business relationship with him. You know, and I mean, he always called me you're my, you're like my brother, man, and all that because we were the bloody brothers and so. stuff. You know, so I mean, it, it was cool, but I mean, I, and, and I and I and I and I meant meant something to me because, but you know, for him to do that to other people, I can't stand by that because they these these were they, they didn't deserve that, and then whether he took their money or you know took or promised them stuff, I mean, you know, which he did a lot of us, I me mean, included, you know, and didn't fall, you know, just he, he just if if like I said it, it it is what it is. But I'm thankful for the, my time there regardless. So during this time, I have to ask, uh, the Taipei Death World series of glass match. Um, John Wayne Murdoch, Satu Jin, defeated uh, the Bloody Brothers 2.0. Uh, when you're going into a match that you know is going to be that 
violent. And I know it's a, just another version of another question I've already asked. Like, what was that like planning process wise, getting ready to go into that when you knew that that match was going to be turned up to 11 the entire time, all 12 minutes of it, it was just going to be nuts. What was it like? What was it like going into that? Uh, exciting. Cause I hadn't, I had just started back, uh, cause I had been gone for a while. So, uh, I had just started back to getting back to active, uh, competition. So, or what have you. And, uh, I was really excited because for one, you know, this is, you know, the bloody brothers uh, thing, you know, it's very close. It's something very close to me. And, uh, and I was, I was very happy to do it with JC and, and, so, but yeah, you know, I just, I mean, we just, I don't know, man. It's like putting your socks on in the morning. You don't really, for, for when you work with guys like that, you just kind of, you just kind of, it's kind of just putting one foot forward and, and, and repeat, man, because they're just so damn good. And you just kind of lock up. And, you, and, and I mean, I'm serious. You can just kind of feel, I don't really have to say a whole lot. I mean, and, and like I said, well, I just kind of explained to you earlier about, okay, we'll do this, this here, this here, and this here. And, and fill in the blanks and go for the finish. All right, yeah, okay, good. Let's go out there. And then that's it. That's it. And those, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's basically how it is. I can't. I, I wish there was more, more to the, more, more to the story that I could tell you. But that's well, at least in my experience, it is. I think that's cool though, because when you think about it, like I said earlier, I use the analogy that it's like you can pick whatever version of wrestling you want to watch. It's it's kind of refreshing to hear that, though, to know that a lot of the planning and the processes that go into the matches are all still the same, you know? Like, I say a lot of times we don't want to yuck anybody's yum. You know, like yeah. deathmatch wrestling might be somebody's thing. I personally love it. Um, I've recently become more of a fan of it. But do you think looking at it from a perspective of the big picture, say an AEW-style thing, when you look at somebody like Moxley, Moxley cut his teeth on the indies going through the deathmatch stuff. He got big. And now in AEW, a lot of people say one way or the other, it's too much blood or he's not doing what he wants to do in his matches because of the AEW stuff. What do you think about the exposure people like Moxley are bringing onto the hardcore and the deathmatch scene for you guys? Like to have that exposure on such a, a grand level of somebody who's been the king of the deathmatch. You know, just recently he held world titles in GCW and CCW. So uh, I yeah you know, I, I think it's great um, because for one I get that I when when I first started doing deathmatch wrestling years and years and years ago you know uh, I was one of the one of the I guess want to say pioneers of it you know late, at least in the uh, early middle ages of it and uh, I, I was and I was one of the I was definitely I was definitely one of the first in the South. I was the one that's one of the one, me tank freak show all of us. We were the ones that were uh, spider. We were the ones bringing it up here, and uh, we we caught a lot of flack, you know, from the old school guys. Oh, that's garbage, you know, you, you know, you know this that that's that's trash, you know. You, you you don't know how to wrestle. People who people who do death matches can't wrestle. They can't work. They can't. They're untrained. Okay, well, there's there's several guys now that's uh, been that's made it up and been a world champion that's done a few. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, I mean, what do you guys say now? I mean, th th it's like I said, uh, wrestling is a lot. I don't want to compare it to dancing, but, but I, I guess in, in, in the styles, I will, because I mean, dancing, you've got the samba, you know, the salsa, the pasta doble, you know, you, you have all these different dances. Some people like the ballroom dancing, break dancing, you know, you, you know, whatever. There's all kinds of different dancing and people have their dancings. It's the same in wrestling. You got the lucha, you got the traditional, you got the European style, you got the hardcore, you have, you know, you, you know, you have all, you know, you, you have death match, you have whatever, you know, and everybody has that. So, I mean, it's, it, it's variety. Is the spice of life, man. So I mean, I'm all for guys like John Moxley being able to put a, a light on guys, you know, de the deathmatch community, put credibility to guys, you know, say like, hey, we're not just for the most of most of us, I can say, we're not just a bunch of schlubs who just just hit each other, you know, reckless abandons. We don't know any better, you know. 
one of my favorite things to ask is always, especially somebody like you who's traveled Tennessee, Indiana, North Carolina, you've been all over the Midwest and the American Southeast. What is the reception like when you go from territory to territory, um, wrestling in Tennessee and then being in Indian, uh, Indiana and then being in North Carolina? What's it like going from, you know, market to market or territory to territory for you guys? Well, um, if, if it's a, a no, I mean, I, I, it's pretty much the same because, I mean, if you're a deathmatch fan, I mean, it's kind of like I'll compare it to music, you know, it's like like underground bands, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll come travel, see the people. You might see the same fans. There's some, there's some new faces there, too. It's kind of like going to a rock club or something and watching your favorite band play. So, you know, it, that, that's kind of like how, 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 I, how I compare it to. You know, there, you got them, them people who are like, oh, shit, man, you're the man, you're awesome, you know. And then you have, you know, some people you've seen a hundred times. And then you got some people come up to you and say, man, I've never seen you before. And thank you or whatever. And, you know, it's 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 it's, it's a lot. This style is a lot more, it was a lot more receptive up, up further up north. And down south, it really wasn't. The kids liked it, though. And they still do. It's starting to get a little more accepted for here in the south now because you know it, i guess because it's starting you know it's, it's, it's everywhere so you know but you know i've always i've always noticed the kids kind of the, the kids all, from the south up to the north love it but the adults up up north love it more than the adults in the south do especially the older adults older adults they can't stand it <laughs> <laughs> do you uh do you get uh, still in, in 2022 when you go and you work a, a death match, do you still get a lot of heckling in, from the crowd? Do they still come at you guys hard every show? I mean, they, they, chew, they, 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 they cheer and boo just like everybody else. You know, they'll say they, they like you. They'll tell you what you think. I mean, I don't really – I, I mean, I, I really c- couldn't tell you. I mean, I, they, as, long as, as long as they're making noise – they're caring about what I'm doing, and that's all that matters. All right, Lane. Well, I close all of my interviews with five rapid-fire questions. I've got yours queued up, ready to go. You ready? All right. Yeah, let's go, man. Who's your favorite musician? All... Or performing or performing artist, group, however you want to look at that question. Uh, Hall & Oates. Yeah? Yeah. One of my, the funniest thing about Hall & Oates, did you know there's a phone line? That you can call. It's yeah. called Call and Oats, and they let you listen to Hall and Oates songs on the yes. phone. I also like Genesis. Genesis. Big Phil is, Collins fan. Phil Big Collins Phil is a beast musician. Yes. Um, oh, we'll do you have a favorite that. movie? Uh, I'll say Highlander. Also a good pick. What's your favorite food? Food, chicken, and dumplings. That's a solid Homemade. pick. I'm a, a chef by trade and mark by choice is my, my catchphrase. I spent 15 years in the restaurant industry cooking Southern comfort foods. So, uh, oh, yeah. you know, good Southern <laughs> things like, uh, you know, the chicken and dumplings for sure. Do you have a favorite venue you've wrestled in? A favorite venue? Um, I, I like the, uh, the ECW arena. That will probably always be one of the coolest. And tre- the, the Tremont Music Hall in Charlotte was really neat, too. That was cool. I've been to a few of them. What was it like having a chance to, to wrestle in Philly for that crowd? Because that crowd is notorious. You talked about ECW earlier yeah. in the interview. Yeah, because well, yeah, I was at CZW there. I was yeah. at CZW, too, back then. Yeah, and I, I got to work there several times. And uh, and Ian worked there, did a show there, too. And, oh, my gosh, man. I mean, it was wild because it was kind of like I never got to wrestle at the Sportatorium. So this was kind of like my way of being like, oh, cool, I got this cool to wrestle in a – a, a, a little dinky ass building that's legendary, just like that one. So it was cool, man. I loved it. I had a that it was. I was. I walked. I was like, I watched Kimono Wan lay a dance atop that scaffold building, you know, or what, you know, stuff like that. And you know, oh, they rebuilt that. I was like, oh shit, never mind. <laughs> uh, last one. What is your favorite city you've wrestled in? My favorite city. Oh man. Um, <sighs> I'm, I'm I'm going through a lot of them. I, I've re- I, I, there's some cities I really like. Uh, I've always liked. Uh, God, um, you kind of got me got me stumped. Right here in 
too. I'm a, I'm a, you know what? I can, Charleston, West Virginia keeps popping in my head for some reason. And, and, and that's because every, I, I've all, I got to, I've wrestled Abdul the Butcher that, over there, and I got to wrestle Jackie Numazawa over there. I mean, and, and every time I was there, the fans there were really, really cool. And we got to hang out, and they had a little after party there at this nice, cool bar. It was, it was a good time. So, I mean, Charles, they, I really enjoyed the fans there. So, when you wrestled Abdullah, did he use the fork? A bro- uh, broken glass bottle. Oh, okay. I was just, I was curious about it. He, he's notorious. He always had that fork on him. So, that's, yeah. that's still cool to have an opportunity to work and with somebody. We- yeah, we didn't even get in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there were very few times in Abdullah's career that he spent a lot of time in the ring, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Lane, this is my favorite part of the episode, man. Plug your stuff. Tell everybody where to find you, what you've got going on, anything you've got coming up that's pertinent. Okay, well, yeah. Hey, um, y'all can find me on Twitter at The Psychedelphic. Um, you can find me on Instagram, Insane Lane uh, underscore IG. Uh, um, uh, what's that thing called? Facebook, uh, mental Messiah, all in word. Uh, I have merch. You can go to deathmatch worldwide. Um, uh, go find insane lane down there. Go pick you out a shirt, please. My son wants some more Christmas presents. Uh, also have other merch at dieharddesigns.com. You can check out there. They've got exclusive, uh, only shirts you can get there, including ultraviolet dad. Um, 2023 uh, this will be my last year so uh, as an active uh, profession uh, actively seeking bookings I will be doing so let's make this count and I'll be looking forward to seeing you all in next year Lane I appreciate you stopping by and chatting about some wrestling with me brother appreciate it well you have a good night man you as well for the mental Messiah I am the will gray thanks for stopping by and listening my people.